shepherd's pie. We're talking tender, flavorful lamb with a cloud of fluffy mash on top that will comfortably feed the whole family without breaking the bank and cost of living crisis be damned. Let's get into it. Now, as the name suggests, shepherd's pie is made of shepherds. It's made of lamb. Lamb, yes. Shepherd's pie is made of lamb. I've got some great mince lamb from my local butcher today and I've pulled it out of the fridge about 20 minutes before I'm ready to cook and just broken it up a little bit. That mince is traditional for this dish, but for my shepherd's pie, I like to elevate it a bit. And what better way to do that than by adding some wonderful sweet roasted lamb flavor. For that, I've got this beautiful half shoulder on the bone and I'm just gonna roast that with a little bit of red wine. This is completely optional. You can leave this out and probably should if you're just making dinner for a Wednesday night but it does add some great flavors and textures into that special occasion pie. To get this started, let's preheat the oven to 170C, 340 convection, a bit higher for conventional, and then I'll just season this generally with salt, just cooking salt is fine, and a few good twists of black pepper. As usual, this is more meat than you'd think, and we're only seasoning the outside, so be generous. Nobody likes a salt miser. Give that a good rub to ensure it's evenly seasoned and then grab a small roasting tin and roughly chop an onion into slivers to give us a bed for that lamb to sit on. On goes that lamb and then I add about 250 milliliters, a glass or so of red wine. Pretty much anything will work here. Personally, I prefer a fresher red with less bite, something fruity like a Beaujolais or a light Pinot Noir, but I don't have those in the wine cupboard today, so this robust Malbec will have to do. Usually for a shoulder, I'd slow roast, but that's not what I want today. I want some good chunks of lamb with a bit of bite to them, and I want it to still have some pinkness to it, as lamb should, IMHO. So I'll go with seven minutes per 100 grams, which is about half an hour per pound, I think. I'm adding a few sprigs of rosemary here too, which will give us a good bit of background flavor in the juices later. This is about 750 grams or one pound 10. So I'll cook it for 55 minutes and then I'll let it rest and cool completely. In that goes, time is set, so let's get on with the rest of the pie. I'll start with an onion, just a good sized brown onion is perfect. And I'll peel that and I'll chop it sort of semi-finely. There's no need to finely dice it, but I don't want any super big chunks. Ideally, this will melt into the background in the finished dish, but don't stress too much about it. Next up, garlic and a good amount, about five or six good sized cloves. Thanks to John Stout for this tip. Crush the garlic before topping and tailing it, and it will just fall out of the skin. Top time-saving tip there, John. Cheers. Once they're peeled, I'll just roughly chop them and set them aside, separate to the onion, as I don't want them both to go in at the same time. I happen to have some carrots that need using up today, and these will bring some texture contrast and sweet flavor to the pie. So I'll just peel and roughly chop those into good-sized chunks that will stand up to the longish cook that we're gonna do today. And finally, the potatoes. As usual, I'm using a flowery Maris Piper. Whatever flowery variety you have locally will work. Waxy potatoes or a mixture of the two can work for this. Personally, I like the lighter mash I get with flowery, but you do you. I'll just peel those and chop them very roughly into one inch-ish cubes, which I'll pop into some cold water to chill out and soak out some of that excess starch. Potato top pies are some of the finest comfort foods money can buy. They're easy to make, easy to eat, fill in, and if done right, super delicious. We'll be making the mash slightly differently to how I'd normally do it today to account for the fact that it needs to stand up to that second cook in the oven. More on that later, but for now, let's get started on the filling. We'll need to get some color onto the meat. So in a pan large enough to do the whole thing in, I'll get some high smoke point oil. I'm using sunflower, good and hot over a medium high heat. Once that's shimmering, in goes the minced lamb along with a good strong grip of salt. Again, don't be shy. And a few twists of freshly ground black pepper. Then I'll just let that brown, moving it around and breaking it up occasionally to ensure it colors evenly. Lamb is a naturally fatty meat, so you'll get quite a bit of fat come out of this as it cooks. That fat is chock full of flavor and we will use some of it later. But for now, I'll just pour most of it off into a bowl and set it aside. Then I'll move the meat into a second bowl to hang out while we sweat down the veg. The carrots are chunky and there's quite a lot of water in them, so I'll toss those in first to begin to get a bit of color over that high heat. I'm not trying to cook these at this point. I'll just give them a minute or two, tossing occasionally, and then next, in goes the onion. I'll turn the heat down to medium low at this point and add another good grip of salt. And then I'll just let these sweat down, stirring occasionally to ensure nothing's burning for three or four minutes until softened and starting to turn translucent. Into that goes half the garlic, 
save the rest for later, you'll see. I'll give that a quick stir and let it cook for a minute or so until it's aromatic. As soon as that happens, I'll go back in with the lamb and about a teaspoon or so of plain flour. The flour might seem weird and we don't need a lot of it. The intention isn't really to thicken anything, but to help hold the emulsion together. The starch in that flour isn't much use as an emulsifier in itself, but the network it will develop will help hold the water and oil in suspension and just make it less likely to separate on us. Next, a glass, maybe 250 mils, just under half a pint of that red wine. Whichever you use for the roast lamb is good, and I'll bump the heat a bit to bring it to a simmer. Now, I like a bit of herbage in my shepherd's pie, and for that, I want a bouquet garni. You can go the traditional route of tying up a bunch of herbs with string and dropping them in, but I found these little herb ready-made tea bag things in Tesco the other day, and they'll save me a bit of time, so one of those goes in. There's thyme in that already, but I like a bit of extra punch, so I'm going to add some more. Again, you can do fresh if you like, but dried herbs are made for a longish simmer like this, so I'm just reaching for those. Next, add a couple of lamb stock pots. If you have homemade lamb stock lying around, then by all means use that. It will be awesome. I don't, so these things will do. Mine are made by Knorr. Other brands are available, but use something of decent quality. We're asking a lot from these in terms of our flavour story, so it's worth spending a few pence extra. Finally, a glass of water just to get things kicked off. That's maybe 200 mils, 250 mils. And then I'll bring this to a spirited simmer before turning the heat back down and leaving it to simmer uncovered until it's well reduced and the carrots are tender, but still with some bite. 30 to 45 minutes. While that does its thing, let's get some mash made. Now, as usual, the first thing we need to do is get rid of the excess starch from the potatoes. So for that, I'll rinse them really well and I'll change the water a few times until it's good and clear. Once that looks good, in goes a good pinch of salt and then I'll set those over a high heat to come to a boil before reducing the heat a bit and just letting them go. Now, total cooking time on these potatoes will be about 20 minutes, but do check them occasionally. As soon as they're fully forked tender and break apart when poked, they're done. This next step is totally optional, but I love lentils in a shepherd's pie. I know, I'm odd. These are just some dried green lentils that I've rinsed really well, super important. And the filling has been simmering for about 20 minutes or so at this point, so I'll just drop those in, stir them through, and keep an eye on the liquid from this point on. We don't want this to end up soupy. It should be quite dry when it's done, but those lentils will soak up quite a bit of water. So if it starts to look too dry before it's done, top it up with a little more. That's the timer for the roast lamb, so I'll pull that from the oven. This looks amazing. It's beautiful colour. It absolutely smells delicious. Fantastic stuff. Now, shoulder is quite a fatty cut with a lot of collagen and connective tissue, and the fast roast that we did here won't really have broken that down all that much, but it's ideal for what we want to use today, and we can use what's left for an incredible stock later. I'll put that to one side for now to rest and cool, and I'll take those whiny roasting juices and add them into my filling, being sure to press down on those onions and herbs to get all the flavour out. Stir that through and let it keep on cooking. I'll check the carrots for doneness at this point and have a look at the consistency. I want this to reduce a little more and the carrots are almost but not quite done. I'll give it another five or ten minutes. Ten minutes later, this is looking perfect. The carrots are cooked but still have some bite. They'll stand up to that oven cook that comes later. I'm calling this done. It does need a little brightness to cut through that savoury fatty lamb. I'm using a little cider vinegar here. Balsamic would do, but it might be a bit heavy. Definitely wouldn't use malt. But whatever vinegar you go with, you don't need much. We don't want this to taste vinegary. And there's plenty of acid from the wine. We just want to add a dash to bring a bit of fresh brightness to the very top of our flavour story. That's perfect. I'll just pop on a lid turn off the heat and let this hang out while I get everything else sorted. The potatoes are done too. These are perfect, fork tender, just falling apart. So off the heat they come and I'll drain them immediately, but I'll hold back some of the potato water rather than letting it all go to waste. Remember I said we were doing the mash a bit differently today? Well, this is that. Instead of traditional milk, I'm gonna use the potato water to lubricate the mash. Milk is great generally, but for this dish, I think the water works really well. Plus it's already hot, it's already seasoned. It'll also help the mash be less creamy and let the butter and garlic really shine through, which works super well on a shepherd's pie. 
Speaking of butter and garlic, while the potatoes steam, I'll melt some good quality salted butter. This is maybe 50 grams or two ounces-ish. Into the pan that the potatoes cooked in, and then I'll add in the other half of the garlic that we saved earlier. I'll let that cook over a medium heat until it finishes foaming and the garlic just starts to take on a light color. And then I'll toss in a good handful of chopped fresh rosemary. I'll leave that on a low heat for half a minute or so until it's fragrant. And then let's mash. In go the cooked and steamed mostly dry potatoes and I'll just start breaking those up. I'm going in with a pinch of salt at this point. Don't go crazy. We can adjust it later if needed. I'll just give this a good mash to get things started. And then when I can see where we're at texture wise, I'll start adding back some potato water a little at a time, thoroughly mixing each addition until I get the consistency that I'm looking for. Now for shepherd's pie, you want your mash to be slightly drier than you'd probably make it if you were serving it as a side. And a few rustic lumps are no bad thing. So switch to a spoon once you have this kind of texture. This is looking great. I'll check the seasoning. It needs a touch more salt, so I'll add that. I'm just adding some sea salt crystals here, which will give some distinct salty pops in the final dish. It also needs a bit of pepper. White pepper works really well, but I seem to have run out somehow and I forgot to buy more. So black pepper it is, and that's done. That lamb shoulder has had plenty of time to rest now, so let's get that sorted next. As I say, the collagen in here won't have gelatinized with the quick roast. So I'll just carefully cut this into chunks, being careful not to get that connected tissue and leaving aside any really jelly-like bits of fat. The aim here is just to provide some texture contrast and wonderful deep roasted lamb flavor. It doesn't matter that we won't get a ton of meat off this. It's just the cherry on top of the mince lamb main event. I've set aside the bone and connective tissue for later. You could boil this with some carrots, onions, and herbs to make an amazing stock, which will freeze really well for your next shepherd's pie. Or if you can't be bothered to do that right now, and honestly, I wouldn't blame you, then you can just freeze the lamb as it is and do the stock thing later. I'll just add those chunks of lamb to the fill-in along with the juices from the board, and then I'll stir everything through to combine. And I'll just give it a quick taste as an excuse for a snack just as a final check that I'm happy, and I am. Wow, let's assemble that pie. For that, I'll just place the filling into a wide oven-proof dish that's deep enough to comfortably hold the filling and potato topping. I'll leave an Amazon link down in the description to a dish that's similar to this one in case you don't have one handy, but you can get one from pretty much anywhere. Once that filling is in a nice even layer, the move is exactly the same as for cottage pie. I'll just use a fork to build up an even topping of the mashed potato. Obviously, you can pipe this on if you like, and you'll get a more refined look to your pie, but I don't need the hassle and associated cleanup of piping bags, so it's the fork method for me. And to be honest, I prefer a more rustic look to my potato top pies anyway. Whenever I pipe the potato on, I immediately think of those sad supermarket ready meal cottage pies assembled endlessly by soulless machines. <laughs> Whatever, go whichever way you want to go. Once I've got a good even layer of potato on top of my pie, I'll go around the edge with the fork to form a light seal, and then I'll rough up the top to give me more crispy bits. Definitely do this. The crispy bits really are the thing that makes this. Now this is slightly cheeky, totally non-traditional, but a little bit of Parmesan, freshly grated, absolutely perfect, really sets it off. Strongly recommend. And that's it. This goes onto a baking tray, unless you enjoy cleaning up burned on mess from your oven floor, and into the oven at 170C or 340F convection, a bit higher for conventional, for about 40 minutes, until it's got some lovely brown bits on top, and the filling is just starting to bubble through. This looks perfect. It smells divine, I can't even begin to tell you. It's an absolutely delicious shepherd's pie that's perfect for a family dinner, a Sunday, when you've got guests coming over, the depth of flavour is immense, it'll leave everyone satisfied. Give this a few minutes to cool, then dish it up generously onto some nice plates, add some green veggies of your choice, and then dig in and be delighted. Cottage pie, an absolute British classic, but it can be kind of tricky to make. The mash can sink, the whole thing can be bland, it can be a little bit too sort of meh. I want to share with you an absolutely fantastic recipe that I developed, perfect for a weekend. Let's get into cottage pie. 
I've got four good sized red potatoes today. These are Manitou, which is a rather flowery variety. If you're in the US, I guess Russet would be the go-to here, but I'm not really sure. Let me know down in the comments. Peel these potatoes as we normally do before chopping them into roughly two and a half centimeter or one inch cubes. There's no need to be overly precious about the size for this, as long as the chunks are of similar mass and not too small, we'll be fine. As I chop these, I'll move them straight over into a pan of cold water to begin to soak out any excess starch. We'll give them a good rinse later to really get rid of that. As I mentioned in other videos where we do mash, we do want to get rid of that starch to avoid a gluey final product. But honestly, it's not as big of a concern here since we'll be baking this mash anyway. Potatoes done, I'll move on to onion. And for this, I just want one decent size brown onion which I'll quickly chop into a medium dice using my usual halve strip the leather out the layer slice on the grain and then chop across it method again no need to be overly precious but try to avoid any really large chunks since we won't be cooking this for hours on end like we do for some dishes next up carrots I just have five regular sized orange carrots here I'll peel these, top and tail them, and then just chop them into bite-sized chunks. I like a bit of bite in my carrots in the finished dish, so I'll chop them fairly chunky. If you want them quite soft, then do smaller chunks than I'm doing here. That way you won't have to change the cooking time. Once these are done, I'll move them over into a bowl, and then I'll go over to the sink and finish rinsing these potatoes. Under a cold tap, I'll just give them a real good rinse, keeping them moving, and change the water a few times until everything is looking nice and clear. That's the veg done, so let's move on to the meat. This is some good quality steak mints I got from my local butcher. It's much fresher than the stuff you can get in the supermarket. Just look at the colour and nice fine grind on this. Get to know your local butcher if you can. That said, there's nothing wrong with supermarket mints. Go with something nice and lean if you can. It will save you draining off all that fat. Something like 5% will work great. I'll get a good sized pan with a bit of high smoke point oil, nice and hot over a high heat. I'm using sunflower oil today. Use whatever you have available as long as it's neutral and has a high smoke point. So once that's good and hot, I'll drop in the mince and add a good grip of salt. Just regular cooking salt will do. Save the fancy stuff for later. After a couple of minutes, I'll go in with my implement of choice. This is a silicon spatula, you do you. And I'll start to break up the bigger chunks to give everything a chance to brown. So I'll just let this continue browning over that high heat, moving it around and breaking it up every once in a while for evenness. I want all the water to be gone and for the meat to be starting to take on some color. So maybe seven or eight minutes. Once things are browning nicely and I hear that telltale snap, crackle, pop from the pan, I'll clear a space in the middle and go in with a good squirt of good quality tomato puree. That's maybe 40 grams. I'll let that sit there for a minute, poking and prodding with my spatula, just to ensure it's got good contact with the pan. And then just when I'm worried it's going to start burning, I'll roughly stir it into the beef. As soon as that's done, I'll follow it with a generous helping of Worcester sauce. Don't be shy, maybe 15 or 20 glugs. This is absolutely essential to our flavour story. I'll chase that with a good few glugs of Henderson's relish. If you're not familiar with this stuff, it's a spicy tomato relish from the north of England. If you're in the UK, you might be able to find it in your supermarket, but I've added UK and US Amazon links down in the description, just in case. A similar amount to the Worcester sauce goes in, and then I'll quickly get in and stir everything together before it burns. You'll notice this begins to caramelise almost immediately, and it lends a wonderful brown colour and a deep, rich aroma to our meat. The flavour here is already well on its way to immense. Just a minute or two of stirring to finish and I'll pull that off onto a plate and let it hang out while we get the veg sorted. For that, I'll set the heat slightly lower, but still pretty high and add another good squeeze of oil, which I'll follow with the carrots. Now I'm not looking to cook these at this point, just to get a bit of color on them, which will help bring out their sweetness and add flavor. I'll fry them pretty hard, moving them around to coat evenly in the oil and maximize contact with the pan and just letting them sit and colour in between stirs. Once they start to develop a slight colour and are slightly aromatic, I'll turn down the heat to low, push the carrots to one side and add in my onions. Now I want these to soften and turn translucent without really browning. So I'll just make sure they're evenly distributed in the oil and I'm gonna add another good pinch of salt. This will both season the onions and help prevent them browning. And that's a great trick to have in your arsenal whenever you're cooking onions. I'll follow that with a few knobs of butter this is maybe 30 or 40 grams total, and I'll just let that melt into the onions. The idea here is to help cool the pan a bit and bring an extra dimension of flavor into the finished dish. So on low heat, I'll make sure everything's nicely distributed, and then I'll pretty much leave it alone to gently cook until the onions are just softened and translucent. 
about three or four minutes. When things are looking good, I'll stir it all together to give the carrots a final minute or two in the butter to help bring those flavors together. And then I'll turn up the heat to medium low and I'll bring that luscious meat mixture back into the party, making sure to get all the meat and juice off the plate and back into that pan. Before I stir everything together, I'll add a good pinch, maybe a teaspoon of smoked paprika into the mix. This is totally optional but it will add a very slight undercurrent of spice to the finished dish. You'd be hard pressed to pick out the flavor in a taste test, but you'd definitely miss it if it wasn't there. To me, these little notes are what makes for a great flavor story. Optional, but recommended. I'll stir that through the mixture and then I'll follow it with a little plain or all purpose flour. This is half a tablespoon, about seven grams. I'll just throw that in and stir it through as well. Now, once the flour's in, things will burn really easily. So I'll keep it moving and just let it cook for a minute or two just to take the raw edge off that flour. After a couple of minutes of cooking and regular stirring, I'll go in with some beef stock. If you happen to have some homemade stock hanging around, then by all means use that and it will definitely be awesome. I don't have that today though, so I'm using pre-made stock from the supermarket. One of these packs holds 320 mils, which is perfect for this recipe, so I'll just stir this in, making sure to give the bottom a light scrape to deglaze it as I do. The whole pack goes in and I'll just give it a final stir to combine before turning the heat back down to almost as low as it can go. And then I'll let this hang out for about 10 minutes while we get the potatoes started. Nothing complicated here. I'll just set the potatoes in cold water over a high heat on a medium burner. Add a strong grip of salt. Again, the cooking salt's good. Don't bother with the fancy stuff. I'll give them a quick stir and leave them to come up to the boil. Five minutes or so later, I'll quickly check on the meat and things are looking great. The stock is reduced by about half and it's looking thick and delicious. The carrots need more time and the flavours will benefit from it too. So I'll pop on a lid to keep things from drying out while everything comes together. After another 10 to 15 minutes, our potatoes are boiling nicely and I'll check on that meat. The carrots are really the thing I'm using to gauge the doneness here. Once they're almost but not quite at the level of bite I want in the finished dish, I'll call the whole thing done. So I'll just grab a fork and have myself a little carroty snack, which is also a good opportunity to check the seasoning is where I want it to be. These are absolutely perfect for me, so off goes the heat. If you want yours a little softer, then just throw that lid back on and let them go for another few minutes. It won't hurt anything. Check on them regularly, though, and stir everything when you do so that you don't overshoot or let anything burn. We want to round things out with a bit of acid and a touch of sweetness. My secret weapon here is HP sauce. This is tangy slightly sweet and deliciously spicy it will elevate our cottage pie to a whole new level now a little does go a long way here i'll add maybe a tablespoon but feel free to go gently add taste and add more if you like like all things it's easy to add and hard to take away so if this is your first time don't be afraid to take it slow of course it's totally optional the work we've already done will make this dish great if you don't have the hp and from what i hear you could sub in something like a1 steak sauce and be 90 percent of the way there but i do recommend getting some hp if you can you might broaden your horizons a bit you'll likely find a ton of other uses for it and it keeps basically forever once that's good and stirred in i'll drop in some frozen peas the quantity isn't massively important so be guided by how much you like peas for what it's worth, this is maybe 150 to 200 grams. Now you can leave these out if you like, but they do have the added benefit of helping our sauce cool more quickly. So if you omit them, let the sauce cool for a couple of minutes longer before assembling the dish. I'll just stir those in to distribute them evenly, and then I'll throw the lid back on over this pan. The pie filling is done. Now we're just waiting on those potatoes. After 25 minutes of cooking, these should be almost there. I'll test them with a fork as usual, but I'm not looking for these to be as tender as I would normally want for mash. The cottage pie, we want a slightly drier, firmer mash that won't turn to mush or worse, sink into the filling. So I'm looking for these to be tender and to break easily when poked with a fork, but to still give a little bit of resistance beforehand. These are absolutely perfect. So I'll take them off the heat and drain them into a colander immediately. If you plan to serve extra gravy with your pie, you monster, then you might want to save this water but I've got no use for it, so down the sink it goes. I'll give these a quick shake and then put them to one side for five minutes or so to steam dry. While that happens, I'll grate up some mature cheddar for the mash. This is maybe 120 grams. Feel free to use more or less as you like, but we will be adding extra on top of the pie in a bit, so be careful if going big. I'll just run this through the large holes on my box grater and call it done. To bring the mash together, I'll just return the potatoes to the pan they cooked in 
and I'm feeling a bit saucy today, so I'll add in a good teaspoon or two of creamed horseradish sauce. Whichever brand you have handy is good. This is another thing that won't be super forward in the finished dish, but it will add a lovely extra note to the flavour that you'd miss if it wasn't there. Highly recommend, but again, leave out if you wish. To that, I'll add 100 grams of butter and all of that cheese. I usually add warm milk to my mash, but for cottage pie, we don't want that. Remember, we need this mash to stand up to being cooked on top of the filling, so less is more when it comes to moisture content. I'll just go in with my potato masher and give this a good mash until everything's mashed and combined. I'm not going for my usual silky smooth consistency. I prefer a slightly more rustic mash with cottage pie, so I'll mash just until there are no noticeably big lumps. Once I'm happy with the consistency, I'll check the seasoning. This needs salt and a little bit of white pepper. I am using sea salt crystals here, which I'll crush slightly as I sprinkle them in. I like the little salty pops this gives the finished mash versus the homogenous seasoning cooking salt would give me. But again, you do you. While we're checking seasoning, I'll check on the filling as well. This is good, nothing else needed, but adjust to your taste. You might want to add a bit of freshly ground black pepper. All that's really left for us to do now is assemble our pie. To do that, I'll grab an oven proof dish that's the right size for our filling plus potato. What are you doing? Just. Oh, yeah, very professional. Really professional. So to do that, I'll grab an oven proof dish that's the right size for our filling plus potatoes. This one is 27 by 22 centimeters or about 10 and a half by eight and a half inches. And I'll start by loading in the filling. I'll make sure that things look evenly distributed. In fact, I'll spend way too long doing that with only limited success. And then I'll start loading up the potato on top. You could go with piping this on if you wanted, assuming your mash is smooth enough. My mash is probably a little on the rustic side for it. And anyway, I don't want to have to deal with the cleanup. So I'll just go home style and load it using a fork. The move here is just to grab a good fork full of mash, load it onto the filling and lightly flatten it out. The filling is thick enough that it shouldn't sink, but if you press too hard, obviously you'll test that theory. So gentle is the key. Just keep doing that until you've got a good base layer of potato covering the whole pie, and then use the potato you have left to shore up any uneven parts. The aim is to end up with a nice, even layer of potato across the whole pie. Once that's taken care of, I'll use the fork to go around the edge and create a seal with the edge of the dish. Then just ensure that the middle has plenty of rough spots. These will crisp up in the oven and it gives us a nice contrasting texture. Finally, I'll grate on another 80 grams or so of that mature cheddar for a seriously cheesy finish. And I'll top it with a little more of those sea salt crystals to help everything brown nicely. I'll preheat my oven to 200 degrees C, 400 degrees F convection, or 220 C, 430 F conventional. And once it's hot, I'll put the pie dish on a baking tray for easy handling, and I'll slide it into the oven on the middle shelf. After 25 minutes, this is golden brown and bubbling slightly at the edges and it smells amazing. I'll pull it out of the oven and I'll let it sit for five minutes or so before serving. It's essentially lava at this point and it will just fall apart and burn your mouth if you try to serve it straight away. So give it five minutes, grab a serving spoon and dish up onto your favorite plates or shallow bowls and serve it as is. It's a complete meal, but you'll get no judgment from me if you want to serve some tender stem broccoli with it as well. However you serve this, folks, I hope you enjoy it. I really hope you give this recipe a try. Let me know down in the comments what you thought. Let's complete the potato topped holy trinity with an incredible fish pie that will knock the socks off anyone who cares to try it. Beautiful, perfectly cooked fish in a creamy white wine sauce with an amazing smashed potato topping that you're just going to love. Let's get into it. The base of our sauce today is going to be milk, so let's start there. I've got a good sized brown onion and I'm just going to roughly chop that up into eighths, peeling as I go. I'll toss those into a good sized saucepan and add 500 mils or about a pint of whole milk. Don't worry too much about any bits at this point. We'll pass this through a sieve later. We're just looking to get some flavour infused right now. I'll move that over to a hob over a low heat to gently heat up. I don't want it to boil and I definitely don't want it to burn. So low heat is the key. Let's leave it alone for a few minutes and get that veg prepped. For the topping, I'll just peel five good sized potatoes. I'm not gonna mash these today, so something midway between floury and waxy works well. I have these generic red potatoes. Whatever you can get locally will work fine. You can use floury potatoes such as Mary's Piper or Russet if that's all you can get hold of, but something a little waxier is best, IMHO, since we won't be adding any extra liquid to these. 
Anyway, I'll just peel these and roughly chop them into fairly large chunks. Again, not mashing them, so I don't want them to cook quite as much as I would for mash. So a little larger than usual is good here. I'll take these over to the sink and give them a good rinse to get rid of excess starch. The usual drill, change the water a few times and move them around just to get that starch off. That done, these go over to the hob over a fairly high heat and add in a good pinch of salt and then I'll just leave them alone to come back to the boil. I'll set a timer for 15 minutes, but I'll keep an eye on them. We want them to be almost, but not quite tender by the time they're done, which might take anywhere between 10, 15 minutes, depending on the size of your potatoes. Back at the board, and the last bit of veg prep for now is some spring onions. I love these in a fish pie. Alliums are sorely needed here, but regular onions can be too domineering. These mild spring onions will bring the flavor that we need without overpowering the delicate flavors of that fish. There's nothing much to report here. Take three, remove any dry or leathery outer layers, take off the top wherever that starts to look dry, and then chop through these pretty thinly and just set them aside for later. A few minutes later, our milk has just started to steam slightly, and a quick test with my finger tells me it's just at scold temperature, so I'll pull it off the heat, pop a lid on it, and just let it sit. This will give that onion some time to infuse some flavor and give us a fantastic base for our sauce later. Give it about five to 10 minutes or so. In the meantime, we'll make a start on the brew. Standard white sauce operating procedure applies here. So I'll melt 30 grams of butter into a pan big enough to make the sauce in. And then as soon as the foaming calms down a bit, I'll go in with 30 grams of plain or all purpose flour. I'll give that a good stir around and then over a low heat, I'll keep it moving very regularly for about a minute or two, just until that raw flour smell has gone and it's started to color very, very slight. White wine is the base of choice today, and I like something medium with a just a hint of sweetness. This Australian Chardonnay will fit the bill perfectly. I'll turn the heat off and then add a good glass, maybe 250 mils, while stirring vigorously to fully combine. Make sure to get into the corners and pick up any bits of roux that are hiding there, or they'll be in danger of burning later, and that will totally ruin your day. Trust me on this. Once that's in and fully combined, I'll give it a couple of minutes to cook a bit, and then I'll grab a sieve, and I'll add the milk just in two batches. Now, because this milk is hot, it'll be slightly harder to get it combined than if it was cold. So going in two batches is worth the hassle here, INHO. Add in a batch, stir it briskly to fully mix it in, and then add in the rest and just repeat the stirring. This should leave you with a smooth, well-combined sauce with no lumps of roux left. If you do find you have trouble, have at it with a whisk if you need to. Because that wine is still pretty acidic, there's also a non-zero chance that the milk will split as you add it. Don't worry if that happens. We've got more cooking to do and that'll bring it back together in the end. So just have faith and keep on cooking. Next, fish stock. If you have homemade fish stock hanging around, then more power to you, use that. Alternatively, get some nice pre-made stock from the shop if you can. I had trouble finding either, so I'm reduced to using these stock pots. But to be honest, they'll be just fine for the sauce. We'll have so much flavor going on anyway that these will more than do the job that we need them to. So two of those go in and then back over a medium low heat. I'll stir it thoroughly to mix them in. For the finishing touch, in goes a good amount of dried dill. It's perfect in this dish. You can use fresh if you've got the time and the inclination. You do you. I'm using dried and it will rehydrate fully in the sauce as it cooked. So it'll be perfect. Follow that with a solid pinch of garlic granules. I find these are slightly milder and sweeter than fresh garlic and are a perfect fit in a fresh pie. But of course, you can use fresh if you like. Do what you want. Granules can be a bit grainy, but like the dill, these will rehydrate nicely while the sauce cooks, so it's not an issue that I need to worry about today. Finally, some onion salt. Celery salt works well here too. Use whatever you have. Just don't go too crazy. It's easy to overseason this sauce and we can always adjust it later. So I'll leave that over a low heat to bubble and reduce for a bit, maybe 15 minutes while I get the potatoes sorted out. These are looking great. They're not completely tender and they still give some resistance when poked with a fork, which is exactly what I'm looking for. Notice that they don't fall apart after I jab that fork into them. That's perfect for what we're doing today. I'll pull them off the heat, drain them, rough them up a bit, and then set them aside to steam for a bit. 15 minutes later, this sauce is reduced and thickened to the point where it leaves a trail when I run a spoon through it. It's also come back together after it split slightly when we first added the milk. You see, I told you it would. We want this to be slightly too thick at this point as we'll let it down a bit shortly. And so I'll pull this off the heat and bring it over to the board. To finish the sauce, I want a bit more acid. 
which will work perfectly with the fish and finish building out a good flavor story with the creaminess, the salt, the sweetness from the wine and the acid all working together in perfect harmony. Creme fraiche is my weapon of choice today. And once the sauce has cooled slightly, I'll add in about a tablespoon of that. And then I'll pep things up just a little bit more with the zest and juice of one lemon. It looks like I need a better zester. This blade grater clearly isn't up to the job. I'll grab the box grater and add a new micro blend to my shopping list. Link in the description if you need one too. Finally, for some delicious salty pops, I'll add in a couple of tablespoons of capers. These are brine capers. They're totally optional, but they are very, very good. Definitely worth getting. They keep for a while if you get them in the brine. They're useful in all sorts of other dishes. There's no need to chop these, just drop them in whole. Obviously, if you want to chop them, go right ahead. The fish is the star of the show here, so make sure you get something good quality. If you're one of the lucky ones and you still have a local fishmonger, then pay them a visit and tell them you're making a fish pie. They'll set you up with the best that they have available. If, like me, your local fishmonger is sadly a distant memory, then you'll be visiting the supermarket instead. Wherever you go, be sure to get the fish that's sustainably sourced. Personally, I like MS for this, hashtag not an ad. I have a mixture here, so this is about 750 grams in total, pound and a half of mixed cod, salmon, and smoked haddock. It's worth spending a few pence extra to get the best you can, and if you can only get frozen, that's no problem. It's virtually impossible to buy a fish these days that hasn't been frozen at some point. Yes, even if you live by the sea. And anyway, it refreezes really well, so just give it a few hours in the fridge to thaw before using it in this recipe. Now, I love the mixture of the oily salmon, the delicate cod, and the bold, smoky flavour of the haddock for this pie. It all balances perfectly with the sauce. If you're feeling particularly decadent, throw in some peeled, deveined king prawns too, but be careful. These can end up a bit overdone by the time the pie is cooked. Be careful with the cooking times or they can be quite rubbery. Whatever fish you're using, add it to the cooled sauce and stir gently to combine and then pop on the lid and set it aside. Now these potatoes have been steaming for a few minutes and as mentioned, I'm not mashing them today. I'm just doing a potato crush. I call it smashed potato because I'm enormously clever. So for that, I'll just take my masher and just gently press on the potatoes in the pan to break them apart. I'll use a fork to move it around and make sure I can get most of the really big chunks and then I'll call it done. Right before we assemble the pie, I'll add in those spring onions we chopped earlier. I almost forgot them. Doing this at the last minute helps them stay vibrant in the finished dish and to not melt into the background. Once they're stirred through, I'll transfer this sauce to a pie dish. In hindsight, I probably should have used a slightly bigger one than this, but meh, this did the job, even if it leaked a bit of filling onto the baking tray. All of that filling goes in, making sure to get everything out of the pan. We don't want to waste even a morsel here. And next, I'll just level that off and then using my hands, all the implement options are available, I'll just top the pie with the crushed potatoes. Again, if you're feeling decadent, do this in two layers. Half of the potato, dot with some butter and a little salt if you like, and then top with the rest of the potatoes. I didn't do that today, and if I'm honest, I kind of wished I had. Whatever. Once that's done, give it a very light dusting with a small amount of cheese. I usually like to use a very small amount of something bold like an aged Gouda or even a Comté. But a mature cheddar also works and is probably more traditionally British, so that's what I'm using today. Having said that, I will break with tradition completely and add a small amount of Parmesan. Not much. This is more seasoning really than cheesy flavour, but it definitely adds an extra dimension that you'd miss if it wasn't there. Once those are added, I'll add a pinch of finishing salt and then let's get the oven onto preheat to 180C or 360F convection, maybe 10 degrees C higher for conventional. And once that's hot, in goes my pie on a baking tray, unless you especially enjoy cleaning up burned on messes from your oven floor. And I'll set a timer for 30 minutes and just go off and do something else while this does its thing. Half an hour later, this smells divine. I'll pull it from the oven and yes, it has overflowed slightly onto the breaking tray, breaking tray, baking tray. But other than that, it looks great. There's some great crispy bits on top and it's gonna be delicious. Let this cool down slightly before you serve it and then dish it up generously alongside your favorite vegetable mix. Carrots go really well, as do peas, fine beans. Whatever you wanna use is absolutely fine. And then just dig in and enjoy. And if you want something to watch while you eat, check out this playlist next for the full on pie experience.